So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Genomics England Research Seminar Series 2021. After a COVID-induced pause, uh, we are restarting our seminar series and have two fantastic speakers for you today. Um, and I hope you can all hear me. Um, I'm just going to set the scene a little bit and then uh, hand over to Wayne um, and others. Um, and we will get going. So at the present time, um, the great news is uh, in our Genomics England research environment, we have access now to 3.8 uh, billion clinical data points on 90,000 uh, people uh, with 111,000 whole genomes. And uh, we are gradually adding to our new research environment in uh, the Amazon Cloud in partnership with LifeBit, uh, COVID uh, genomes from severe and mild and asymptomatic COVID patients. Um, and so uh, the available wealth of activity is really in, uh, there for you to uh, make observations and change patients' lives. From the endeavor of all of you, there's over 140 patient papers been published 50 million pounds of research grants have been generated and I congratulate you for that. But the most, most, most important thing you've done is enabled us to return 300 answers to people with rare disease, uh, explanations of why they're like they are um, uh, for the NHS to consider as a possible diagnosis. So that's exactly what we'd hoped you'd do. And I thank you very much for that. Uh, and now what I'm gonna do is move directly on to introduce uh, our uh, first uh, speaker. So Wei Yao is from uh, um, the uh, University College London and uh, works in the group of Henry Holden. Um, and uh, he is going to talk to us about uh, neuronal mechanisms and expansion repeats, I believe. Uh, we've also got a second speaker Seema Mittal, who I'll introduce in a moment. But Wayne, thank you so much for agreeing to do this today. And it's over to you uh, to present to the Genomics England Research Seminar. You have the floor. Wonderful, Thank, thanks Mark. Thanks for the introduction. I'll, I'll share my slide for... Um... So again, uh... Thanks for inviting me to talk about my research as a part of um, the Department of Neuromuscular Disease group from Queen Square Institute of Neurology. Um, I'm talking about um, a neuronal intranuclear inclusion diseases, a very rare new degenerative conditions and how it manifests as movement disorders and the disease prevalence in Caucasian population, the patient population that we see predominantly. Um, and I'd outline my talk would be why am I looking at this particular disorder and, and how is it associated more common new degenerative movement disorders such as Parkinson's disease or essential tremor, et cetera. And also then we'll go through the method how of the studies and I now talk about um, how common is this disorder and how is it associated with the other movement disorder I, as I mentioned and how it impacts on clinical practice. Um, so neuronal intranuclear inclusion disease, as I mentioned before, is a, a historically known to be a pretty rare disorder. Um, it's first recognized in, back in 1968, mainly from kind of post-mortem study where, as the name uh, alluded to, they have inclusion, uh, intranuclear inclusion in the neurons on post-mortem samples. It can be classified uh, it can be divided into either infantile or juvenile adult onsets, and their phenotypes are slightly different. And also, the published cases and the and the ethnicity between uh, uh, the published cases are also a bit different. In terms of the infantile onset, um, is dominated by ataxia and cerebral degeneration. Although it's a more complex type, where they also have cognitive behavior regression, seizures, neuropathy, and spasticity. Whereas the adult form, which that's what I'm predominantly focused on, uh, from one of the seminal papers by Song Ao or they, they have kind of two predominant symptom onset, where there's muscle weakness or dementia predominant, but 
again, it's a complex, dis complex disorder. It also associates multiple other movement disorders, neuropathy, and, and some symptoms, more consistent mitochondrial disorders, such as anchovytic episodes, stroke like episodes, seizures, or autonomic dysfunction. Um, again, uh, as the name alluded, the central feature of this disorder uh, uh, historically has uh, always been um, on uh, the patholo pathological features um, on mycoscopy. It has eosinophilic ubiquitin positive and P62 positive neuronal intranuclear inclusion. And ultrastructurally, it, it usually uh, show up as a dense filamentous material of the membrane structure. However, it's not restricted to central nervous system. It's actually found widespread in other organs, including a skin, a lung, gastrointestinal tract, endocrine tissue, reproductive organs, um, hearts, and urinary tract system. And it, it's kind of almost a uh, similar disorder as to more uh, better known frigid, uh, fragile eggs, uh, trauma taxi syndrome, which, which has been more common in uh, the pa at least the population that I, patient population that I see. And the, not until 2019, uh, when Ishua and, and Zong uh, published their papers on um, nature genetics that they discover the genetic mutation responsible for this disorder is a repeat expansion disorder with a GGC repeat expansion in uh, in the previous note to be MBF, MBPF19 gene, and now reclassified as notch to NLC because previously it's been classified as a pseudogene. As a repeat expansion, the five prime untranslated region uh, on the exon one, or it's not to N NLC gene. And the pathologic, uh, pathological cutoff is around 60 GGC repeat that causes disease. Um, after Initial discovery of the genetic mutation. There's a, a slew of paper talking about the phenotype. And um, firstly, um, by TNA, or they find that in their Parkinson's disease cohort uh, within uh, 205 Chinese Parkinsonism uh, families, there are three family harbor this repeat expansion uh, with no other typical features of a neuronal intranuclear inclusion dis disorder. Um, that's around 1.5% of the cohort. Similarly, they also find patients with essential trauma family, um, uh, 11 of 197 Chinese pedigree, uh, which is around 5.6% of the cohort carry this repeat expansion. Again, similarly, another um, five families or five pole bands amongst uh, 189 clinical diagnosed multiple system atrophy, around 2.6% of the cohort. Uh, Chinese cohort also have this mutation. So this raised the question as that, is this particular repeat expansion notch to NLC causal to Parkinson's disease, essential trauma, mobile system atrophy, or is it where this, this mutation actually just called a phenol copy of this disorder? And we also note that historically, um, this disorder has been published widely and including the initial case um, that uh, in, in, particularly in, in patient uh, European descent, but um, we haven't had any kind of publication related to this particular mutation in uh, uh, outside of East Asia population. So we want to have a look at the prevalence of this disorder in our disease cohort and as well. And what we did was uh, we, we used uh, the, the very useful 100,000 genomes project, uh, we, we focus on the rare disease main cohort. Uh, we uh, identify pole bands with mixed ethnicity uh, and they have both neurological and non-neurological presentation with a total of 30,008 patients. And using their BAM file, um, we run them through the expansion hunter. Um, I, I guess for those, most people will be familiar with it, but for those who are not, uh, it is a kind of default uh, program that 100,000, a tool that 100,000 genome project used for detecting pathogenic repeat expansion. So it pick up reads um, from the BAM file, including spam, spanning read, read set spanning, the actual repeat expansion and the, the bilateral adjacent regions in between reads that uh, look at just uh, uh, the read that just covered the repeat expansion 
and also the flanking reads, a read that cover the repeat, part of the repeat expansion and one adjacent region, and using a maximal likelihood gene, uh, uh, model to estimate the size of repeat expansion. And then I, I then use repeat uh, prime PCR and later southern block and long read sequencing to confirm the repeat expansion. Other than the data from the 100,000 genome, we also got some DNA from each uh, different phenotypes, including 825 patients from Parkinson's, with Parkinson's disease, 207 patients with clinically probable and possible multiple system atrophy, and 336 um, patients from various brain bank with definite multiple system atrophy, and 203 patients with essential tremor, and 203 patients with spinal cell by ataxia. Um, and again, similarly, we went through the process of testing with repeat prime PCR and confirming with some block analysis. And again, for those people less familiar with repeat expansion disorder, we use the repeat prime PCR, uh, much similar, very similar to um, uh, Frank Norm standard Franklin PCR, but um, but we have a primer that target specific to, specifically to repeat expansion with at a much uh, but the primer concentration is much lower than the, the other primer and so it ex get exhausted early in the course of the PCR reaction and then and while after it binds to different part of the repeat um, in the in the DNA and then a second primer that we call anchoring primer um, amplified the um, the DNA Apricorn, and then we will see um, a what looks like a waterfall appearance if there's a if the DNA harbors the repeat expansion, and we also use um, for long read sequencing you use the Oxford nanopore technology have a kind of very simplified um, diagram. It's like a strand DNA being pushed through a nanopore size, which produces electrical signal and is subsequently being base core using guppy after quality control we align it with minimap to and analyze the repeat size of repeat hmm um, so what we found with the hundred thousand genome uh, project data out of the thirty thousand patients we only really found one patient uh, carrying this repeat expansion as patient a um, you can see her repeat prime PCR on the, pan, the upper middle uh, panel, panel uh, the first one, and also her, uh, her southern block on the panel, the upper right, upper panel, patient A, and her IGV view of her non read sequencing at the bottom in the panel C. Um, and in terms of our individual patient cohort uh, screening, we found one patient out of the essential tremor cohort patient B, uh, but no one in the Parkinson's disease cohort, multiple system atrophy, both clinical and uh, um, pathological uh, groups, and also no one in the um, uh, um, essential trauma cohort as well. And in the patient A, uh, her repeat expansion was estimated around 118 on southern blood and between 92 to 106 on the norm rate sequencing and patient B have a slightly lower repeat expansion size at 90. And for patient A, her, her repeat track was pure. So there's sometimes it be, can have a GCA interruption, but in her case, she have a pure GGC expansion. Um, patient A, she's a 60 year old woman that we see at the national hospital of neurology and neurosurgery she he have a, a intriguing presentations that uh, she was initially born in ukraine and she was she developed this recurrent encephalopathy migraine and reversible vocal neurological deficit in her late 30s and subsequently 40s and 50s and progressing to more uh, demanding features uh, demanding uh, stage. Um, uh, the left panel shows some of the MRI scan, which she said some hyperintensity in her uh, right temporal lobe, but also in the corpus callosum and also in the middle cerebellar pedunco. Some of the features that are probably more typical with the fragile 
uh, federal ex tremor attack syndrome. Uh, her examination other than uh, reduced speed processing, she have a more kind of Parkinsonian features and also a kind of postural resting and postural upper limb tremor. Despite of that, her death scan was actually normal. On the right upper panel, you can see a family tree. She's really singleton, although we haven't had a chance to examine her, the rest of the family because they both, uh, are both her son resigned in Ukraine. Whereas patient B is an Italian uh, man who developed postural, bilateral postural tremor of his arm in around mid fifties. Interesting for his family is that he also have a sister with a, a diagnosed with tremor dominant uh, Parkinson's disease and mother died and with a history of Parkinson's disease with tremor dominant as well. Um, these are some of the um, skin biopsy slides, uh, skin biopsy results that were done for patient A, which shows that they, um, a patient A had the typical uh, P62 positive, ubiquitin positive, but TDP43 negative uh, intranuclear inclusions in the fibroblast, epithelium of the serous glands, and endothelium. Uh, what uh, we intrigued us was that we uh, there's such a big difference in terms of how the number we found in our patient cohort compared to the published uh, case, um, which range from 1.5 to 5.6 percent. We, we expect to find more cases carrying this repeat expansion if uh, we have a kind of similar prevalence of disease between different ethnicities. So we went on to look at the um, GCC repeat expansion um, size in in 100,000 genome projects uh, using expansion hunter and custom repeat definition. Uh, what we found was that this the violin plot is that the, there wasn't been really any significant difference in both the repeat uh, expansion frequency or allelic structure in terms of the, the, the presence of interruptions um, between um, Asian, black, or white. So that doesn't really account for a difference in the prevalence. Um, so overall, we feel at this stage, we feel that the GGC repeat expansion notched NLC is fairly rare in Caucasian presenting movement disorders. And in the, at least in the essential tremor core, we can say it accounts for roughly around 0.5% of prevalence. And the background repeat structure and lyric frequency of GGC repeat between different ethnic groups are comparable. So we, we, we're hypothesizing that maybe there's a potential founding effect. In fact, our patient A, she had a, a same haplotype as the, um, as the one that published uh, by the initial paper that discovered this mutation, although she doesn't have uh, any um, Asian ancestry. Subsequent reports um, has somewhat strengthened our, the result of our study, uh, at least from the Canadian group, who set, uh, have looked at um, look at uh, patients with um, beta blocker responsive uh, essential tremor. Within the 204 patients they look at using the whole genome sequencing data, they didn't find anyone um, carrying this repeat expansion, whereas study in um, focusing on different ethnicity when the Singapore uh, group that predominant Han Chinese patients, they did found um, within the 1000 sporadic Parkinson's disease patient, 13 of them carry repeat expansion size at least about 40. And another group in uh, Eastern China uh, again found uh, 21 uh, sorry, uh, three patients out of 228 essential tremor uh, patients carrying this repeat expansion. Uh, interestingly, in our paper against from a Chinese group found that um, intermediate length repeat expansion are also associated with Parkinson's disease. What they did, um, they looked at it, actual repeat uh, expansion size between 40 to 60, as, as similar to many other repeat expansions. Um, sometimes there's a, a region that's 
there's no exact cutoff that there's an intermediate penetrant as such. Um, it's not definitively we can call as pathogenic, but it can be associated with um, disease manifestation. And they're looking at that range 40 to 60, and they find that within the 1,011 PD patients and, and versus 1,000 controls, uh, 11 Parkinson's disease patients carry repeat expansion in this intermediate length repeat expansions. So we went back to look at our data and, and ass assess the size of 825 Parkinson's disease patients and looked at uh, whether they uh, have anyone with carrying this intermediate length repeat expansions. Again, we didn't find anyone carrying this and uh, expansion of a, a maximum uh, repeat size in that PD cohort was up to 40. Another point I want to raise is that I think uh, I, I use uh, Expansion Hunter, uh, which is an excellent tool, uh, and that's one of the two that have been available in the 100, uh, research environment for the 100,000 genome project data. Uh, it has fairly low computational burden, and, and, and uh, it has this um, uh, obviously they have this advantage and disadvantage, but there are com other comparison, uh, other other similar tools available, such as trap pass, extra stretch, and against uh, that can be used to detect repeat expansion and so read whole genome sequencing. And just um, recently, there's a paper on movement disorder that they use um, similar to, uh, I think they use extra to to identify a family who have spinal cell ataxia 36 within the short read whole genome sequencing data. I think this is definitely the way to go to pick up these repeat expansion as, as with the 100,000 genomes project because with the recent, in, uh, recent new reported expansion disorder, repeat expansion disorders, it's, it's be very difficult for kind of diagnostic lab to catch up and develop individual um, PCL based or southern block based tests to test these uh, patients uh, for all the repeat expansion available at the moment. So uh, I guess my last word is that um, based on our research finding, clinicians should really reserve these tests for this uh, um, notch to NLC GGC repeat exp expansion in, in Caucasian patients only for really classical symptoms of this disease, if particularly in the event that the patient have a positive skin biopsy results or typical neurological features, but still retain a level of suspicions for patients with essential trauma or Parkinson's phenotype, although understanding that pre-tax probability would be very low. And also incorporation of the bioinformatic tools with short read sequencing, whole with genome, whole genome sequencing data, for detecting repeat expansion, probably be one of the methods that we can pick up more of these rare repeat expansion disorder from um, from patient without having test each novel repeat expansion on all our patients individually. And I'll also say thank you for all the article authors, including Dr. Jana Vendrakova, Mr. Roshin Selfin, obviously my my supervisor, Professor Nick Wood and Henry Holden, and also my international collaborator the telephone network, Baobanks, um, University of Tokyo. And again, thanks for Genomic England for us, for letting us to use the data in this research environment. Um, and I will unshare. Thank you, Wayne. Um, <clears throat> do you want to switch your video on so we can have some questions for you? Uh, yep. That was a super talk. Well done. That was a really good talk. Thank you very much. What was so pleasing to see is how you're using Genomics England data to look around for uh, explanations of these this type of repeat expansion disorder. Um, uh, we are trying to uh, bring this live in our pipeline, incorporating expansion hunter based on on the work of uh, some colleagues at Genomics England, but also Ariana Tucci. Um, and uh, your quest into areas of unexplained application of this technology is very welcome. Um, in the family where you had an isolated female with a repeat expansion disorder, 
uh, how common is it, it, it um, to have such disorders, but without really any antecedent history, i.e. spontaneous expansion? Um, it is, well, I guess for a pig expansion disorder, it is, it is reasonably common because um, um, particular in, in cases where uh, some of the more common spans very taxia where they have a CAGP expansion disorder um, is known to have anticipations with these conditions anyway. Or, or on the other hand, um, sometimes patient family the parents, uh, such a myotonic uh, dystrophy where they might have um, symptoms that they don't realize until they give birth to their child. I mean, the severity of symptoms um, is much worse in the next generation because of um, uh, the issues with anticipations and clinical expansion when passing on the repeat expansion to the next generation. So I think it is common enough not to have a family history. Yet. Thank you, that's very kind. We've got a few questions that are coming through in the chat. First one's from Seema. Uh, Seema, did you want to just unmute yourself and relay that directly to Wayne? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Wayne. Uh, that was a really excellent talk. Um, I know there's growing interest in structural variants. So the question was, oh, in terms of long-read sequencing, did, we, did you encounter quality or technical challenges? Um, I'm probably not the best person to do because I think in my other co-author co perform most analysis of the long range sequencing data. Um, so I don't think she's, I don't, I'm not sure where she's here at the moment. So, um, but uh, can, can you tell me again, what, what is it, is it the quality of the long range sequencing data you, you're referring to, is it? Well, sometimes it's the quality of the DNA, if you've extracted it, I suppose, and as long fragments versus the regular way we do our DNA extractions, as well as just the bioinformatics processes. Yeah, well, we did, yeah, we did have to get, we get some fresh blood to extract it um, for the patient, particularly where uh, we can't just follow the protocol as recommended. But um, I think we, the, the, because I didn't perform the actual long do the long sequencing, I'm, I'm can't, I don't think I can comment too much on that. Sorry. Okay. Thanks, Seema. Um, uh, Mikhail, you've got a, a question in the chat um, around the RGB browser. Um, did you want to unmute and relay that to Wayne? Okay. So, so one of the problems is that the panelists, it's difficult for us to see in the panel section, the hands up. That's the problem. So uh, at the moment, I can't okay. see the hands up. Uh, I'll bring the participants up and we'll see. Okay. Um, all I can see at the moment is the, okay, right. So uh, Mikhail, your hand was up. Are you ready to do your question? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm just interesting. Is there any difference in the read coverage of this area? Uh, how this repeats looks in the EGV browser? Does anybody? Uh, yeah, so, yeah. so it, it, I, don't, I guess for particular the um, cover, I think with the short resequencing, they don't in cover this region too particularly well, but it doesn't have a, a obvious it doesn't have an obvious increased coverage in this area, suggestive of a repeat expansion. So uh, when I look at IGV from the short sequencing, but, um, um, but when I look at it on the long range sequencing data, they seem to um, certainly look as though that, uh, it, well, I can see the whole read because it's just long range sequencing. But when I look at short sequence data, IGV didn't look that different now. Okay, we've got a question from John Hardy for you, Wayne. John, do you want to unmute? John, are you there? We'll go to... Unmute. Yeah. 
I can't unmute him. So should we go to Yi Cao? Uh, do you want to do your question, Yi? No, it's all clear for me. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Um, so we, we had uh, a question from Zara Sadok to all panelists. How can the epigenetic mut inf influence uh, the GGC mutation, Wayne? Uh, well, yeah, certainly it would be important to consider object influence because I think there's certain methylation changes similar to kind of fragile X uh, syndrome that can cause the, the um, can can result in different phenotype uh, manifestations. But um, I think as far as I know from this particular mutation, uh, the methylation has is not particularly different um, when they're assess it in the actual paper. So that's why we didn't look at it specifically for, for our patients. I think they're still kind of working out exactly um, what the platform mechanism for this repeat expansion um, at the moment, so. Okay, well, I mean, that was a super talk. Thank you very much. And it stimulated some interesting questions. Um, <clears throat> just to let everyone know, the talks will be available after the seminar on the website. Uh, they are being recorded, including your questions. And so thank you, Wayne, for an excellent talk. I'm sure colleagues in the lab, uh, Institute of Neurology are very proud of you today. Thanks a lot. So it's my pleasure now to move to introduce uh, Seema Mittal. Seema Mittal is a world leader in uh, cardiomyopathy research and pediatric uh, chair of uh, heart failure and transplant cardiology um, and a senior scientist at Sick Kids Research Institute um, with which uh, Genomics England has many friends. Um, seems uh, really worked on childhood models of heart disease and she's going to talk to us today about whole genome sequencing in cardiomyopathy in childhood. Thank you Seema, you have the floor. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I will share my screen. <clears throat> Is that visible? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, well, I want to thank you, Mark, for this kind uh, introduction and invitation, and obviously uh, this opportunity to share our research. Uh, I'm, um, I have no disclosures, uh, but I do want to take this opportunity to really thank Genomics England for an opportunity to collaborate with your group, as well as to access all the genomes. It's humbling to see what, your, what Genomics England has done and what it's going to con continue to do, do for the community. Uh, so I'll just start with a case example of a five of a four month old boy with dilated cardiomyopathy for those for non cardiologists in the audience. And so dilated cardiomyopathy is a condition where you get thinning and uh, weakening of the heart muscle compared to a regularly beating heart. So this boy was transplanted at a year of age. Gene panel testing revealed two variants of uncertain significance in RBM 20 and Titan. We did research whole genome sequencing four years later, at which time we identified a pathogenic variant in filament C, and this was confirmed by clinical testing. And the reason it was not captured on the gene panels is because this is a gene that is not currently routinely captured on many commercially available gene panels. And so it took almost five years to make a genetic diagnosis. So what is cardiomyopathy? It's a genetic disorder of heart muscle. It affects one in 500 to one in 3000 individuals with high childhood penetrance. Uh, the, the, it, there are different types of cardiomyopathy phenotypically. These are the five different types. Uh, it's the leading cause of sudden cardiac death and heart failure, both in children and in adults. And at least a third of cases are familiar. But the genetics is complicated in the sense that it's, although it's quite Mendelian, it is highly polygenic with over 100 genes currently implicated and a lot of overlap between the genes that affect the different phenotypic types of cardiomyopathy. Unfortunately, with the current gene panels in use, coding variants in these genes only explain approximately 30% of all cases. So we were interested in using whole genome sequencing to try and find the missing genetic etiology of cardiomyopathy uh, for the obvious reason that genome sequencing will allow us to look at all genes in the genome. It allows us to look at copy number variants with greater resolution. 
And most importantly, it allows us to look, to, allows us to look at the over 98% of the non-coding genome, which harbors regulatory elements that are very important in gene expression. So we took 225 cardiomyopathy families from our own biobank, the Heart Center Biobank, which is a province-wide, Ontario province-wide biobank involving pediatric and adult centers from 10, um, 10, from 10 centers, both pediatric and adult. And for replication, we, you, we accessed uh, 1,266 primary cardiomyopathy cases from Genomics England. And these are primary in the sense that there was no obvious secondary cause to explain the cardiomyopathy. Uh, I'm not going to go into the workflows in detail because this is all available on our preprint in MedArchive, but it suffices to say that we first looked at the protein coding variants in known genes, cardiomyopathy genes, which were 133 genes that are currently available in one or more panels. And we looked for both single nucleotide and copy number variants used primarily the American College of Medical Genetics criteria for pathogenicity. We also looked at uh, protein coding variants or rather loss of function variants in novel genes. By novel, I mean genes that are not really captured in current gene panels, but do affect cardiac structure and function with, uh, with some with good evidence. And finally, we looked for regulatory variants, which is really the main interest in our whole genome sequencing analysis to find whether promoter enhancer variants in these 133 genes were, were enriched in cardiomyopathy. So in terms of protein coding variants, we found that coding single nucleotide variants were, which were pathogenic or likely pathogenic explained 35% of the cases. This was in the known genes. In addition, through, through whole genomes, we were able to identify copy number variants in 2% of cases, again, in these known genes, and 5% harbored so-called novel gene variants. And a couple of those I've highlighted here because we did a little bit more work on these. Uh, we did find that these genes had loss of function variants, not just in our own cohort, but also in the Genomics England cohort. One of these genes is NRAP, which is involved in muscle alpha actin and binding. The other is FHOD3, which is involved in actin filament polymerization in cardiomyocytes. So both are very important for the structure of the myocyte. And both these genes actually are making their way into gene panels. Uh, but what we had at the time was we did have myocardial sample from the patient with the NRAP variant. This was an eight-year-old boy from an unaffected consanguineous family who was uh, in whom there was a multi-generation history of early heart disease. Uh, this gene has been associated with biallelic variants in the context of cardiomyopathy. And so we did find that in the patient myocardium, this patient's NRAP expression was significantly lower compared to all the other patients with cardiomyopathy, around 35 patients, in whom we also had tissue samples, but who did not have the NRAP variant. This was confirmed in qPCR and also in Western blot, where you can see NRAP expression is very low. It's only just 20% compared to wild-type controls. For, we further went on to, to do zebrafish knockouts using four guide RNA through the zebrafish facility at SickKids. And uh, essentially we found that the NRAP and FHOD3 mutants had somewhat of a restrictive cardiomyopathy phenotype manifested by big atria and small ventricles. So as I said, NRAP recently, just this month, there was a publication in PLOS One that uh, revealed uh, several families where they had biallelic variants and at least one company has now incorporated this into their gene testing panel. And I suspect this gene will probably make it into panels as well. Nonetheless, this still leaves us with almost 60% of cases who are gene elusive. So we wanted to see if variants in regulatory elements of cardiomyopathy genes could account for additional cases. So when you think about regulatory elements, the most common are promoters and enhancers. So promoter region is a DNA sequence that is involved in turning gene expression on and off. A promoter region will bind proteins like the transcription factors to create a transcription initiation complex. This in turn binds RNA polymerase II to initiate transcription and form messenger RNA. In addition to promoters, there can be enhancer regions that can sometimes be quite remote or distant from the transcription start site, but these regions can also bind transcription factors, which in turn can bind co-activators and co-repressors, and these can influence the function or activity of the transcription initiation complex and thereby influence gene transcription. 
And studies are showing that variants in the promoter and enhancer regions are causes of human diseases like cancers, autism, and more recently, even congenital heart disease. So just to simplify it, we mapped rare variants to regulatory elements of our 133 uh, cardiomyopathy genes. And we focused on regulatory elements that were active in the human heart based on available literature or databases. We focused on elements that were predicted to disrupt transcription factor binding. And, uh, and we wanted to focus only on the very rare variants that were either absent or seen in less than 0.01% of NOMAD. With this approach, we found that 20% of our cases harbored what we would consider high risk regulatory variants. When we look at the burden of variants in cases in red compared to controls in blue, there was a uh, twofold enrichment of these variants in cases compared to the controls. And these controls are cancer controls that, that were available to us from the International Cancer Genomics Consortium. When we looked by cardiomyopathy subtype, you can see that the contribution of these non-coding or regulatory variants was highest in dilated cardiomyopathies. This shows the, the genes that harbored either protein coding or regulatory variants. And as you might expect, the sarcomeric, sarcomeric cytoskeletal genes were primarily enriched for protein coding variants, but there were several other genes that seemed to primarily harbor regulatory variants. Of note, almost 20%, 19% of the cases had multiple hits. They had a combination of more than one, either protein coding and or regulatory variant. And we are currently analyzing the influence of multiple variants on the severity of the cardiac phenotype. When we did a burden analysis and ranked the genes by odds ratios, we found that four genes ranked at the top in terms of enrichment in cases versus controls. And these were the four same four genes in our discovery cohort as well as in the Genomics England cohort. The odds ratios ranged from five to 53, and this was corrected for multiple testing. Two of the genes, DSC2 and DSG2, are desmosomal signaling genes that have, uh, and the, these, this pathway is very important in arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. Two of the genes were Fukutin and DTNA, and these genes belong to the dystrophin dystroglycan complex, uh, which is known to cause both skeletal myopathy as well as cardiomyopathy. Of note, our patients only had cardiomyopathy. They did, not, they did not have any features of skeletal myopathy. So why is this complex important? Dystrophin, as you know, is an important protein and that links actin filaments to the extracellular matrix protein laminin. And this occurs through the binding or through the interaction with this complex called a sarcoglycan complex, which involves multiple genes. DTNA or dystrobrevin is one of the genes in this complex that is very important for anchoring these together to make the structure assembly stable. And Fukutin, FKRP, large one, and POMT are four other genes that are, that are involved in glycosylation of the dystroglycans in order to make it functionally active. And therefore, again, if there are variants here, they can interrupt glycosylation and thereby disrupt the assembly of this complex, resulting in contractile dysfunction. So what we found, we found high-risk regulatory variants in all of these genes uh, with a higher burden in our cases compared to our controls. So while it's important, obviously, to, uh, to prioritize variants based on replication, based on burden ana analysis with controls, we felt it's really important to do some functional studies to determine if these variants had true regulatory activity. And to do that, where we had patient myocardium available, we looked at endogenous gene expression, and, and we also did functional studies in patient and gene-corrected human iPSC cardiomyocytes. This is the protocol. This was done in collaboration with James Ellis's lab. And in this protocol, we use standard techniques like Senda virus reprogramming to generate human iPS cells from fibroblasts or lymphoblasts. This is a healthy control which has been published by us where we where this is a this is an individual uh, who does not harbor any variants or cardiac disease variants on whole genome sequencing 
We did cardiac, we did gene correction through a service facility that we have access to in Toronto called CCRM. And then we differentiated in our own labs into cardiomyocytes using a small molecule cocktail. So that by day 40, we have functioning cardiomyocytes that are reasonably mature and that show a cardiomyopathy phenotype and is a good point to study their phenotype and their function. So I'm going to show on this slide just a single example of a Fukutin promoter variant and what the results showed. This is a patient who had a variant that caused a substitution of the major allele G with a minor allele A. As you see that with the presence of G, there is a strong transcription factor binding, but the substitution to A can result in, is predicted to reduce transcription factor binding and thereby reduce gene transcription. And that's what we found. This is a myocardium available from the same patient from the time of transplant. And you see here that Fukutin expression on RNA sequencing was much lower than that of the remaining cardiomyopathy patients who did not harbor this variant. This was confirmed on QRT-PCR. And this was also confirmed on protein expression on Western blot where this variant expression, the protein expression in this patient was much, much lower than that in other wild type or cardiomyopathy patients who did not harbor this variant. We did generate patient iPS cells from this patient who had the promoter variant, and we've only done very preliminary work, but what we have shown here is that in this patient, the Fukutin gene expression is much lower than in healthy controls. We are now in the process of gene correcting or variant correction to determine if this can rescue, to first see whether there is a cardiomyopathy phenotype and whether we can rescue the phenotype. And our preliminary data look really exciting, but it's still too preliminary to share at this uh, seminar. So we, we had tissue for this, for our patient with the Fukutin, but we did not have tissue for confirmation in our other patients with variants in these other genes. So we decided to do luciferase reporter assays, which as you know, is a way to ascertain whether a regulatory variant has activity and can influence the transcription of a reporter gene, and in this case, luciferase. So what you do is you take the DNA sequence with an or promoter sequence with and without the variant, couple it with the luciferase reporter. In the wild type situation, there should be abundant transcription, abundant luciferase activity and abundant fluorescence. But in the presence of a functional variant, luciferase activity should be reduced. And that is what we found. This shows that the luciferase activity was significantly reduced in patients or in the presence of a variant in DTNA, FKRP, two Fukutin variants, as well as large one variant. However, luciferase assays are fairly low throughput. So in order to do more high throughput assays, we, we joined forces with Philip Moss's lab, who is a scientist at SickKids, and we did massively parallel reporter assays that allow for functional assessment of thousands of regulatory variants in a single assay. The way it works is that you take an oligonucleotide that contains the variant or wild type or reference allele and tag or barcode it and this library is then transfected. In this case, we transfected it into iPSC cardiomyocytes. RNA is extracted, and then the number of tags or barcodes are counted to determine the abundance of messenger RNA. And this tells you if, if, if there is a wild type variant, there should be uh, abundant messenger RNA. If there is a variant that is interfering with the transcription, it can either cause increase or decrease in the mRNA counts. So this is a volcano plot which shows that 20, a remarkable 29 of our 54 variants were showing regulatory activity that was affecting transcription. Some variants were causing an increase in uh, transcription and others were causing a decrease in transcription. And this is after testing, uh, correction for multiple testing. So we're very excited with this result. So I, actually I'm gonna summarize here to say that we think that with whole genome sequencing, we were able to identify novel coding variants, both copy number variants, loss of function variants and less commonly studied genes in 7% of cases that would not otherwise be found and high risk regulatory variants in 20% cases. And that kind of allowed us to reduce the gene elusive number by almost half. Myocardial expression prof profiling and iPSC cardiomyocyte reporter assays were allowed us to validate the functional activity of many of these novel regulatory variants. And we feel like this, by this 
supports a bioinformatic approach to regulatory variant identification and interpretation, and perhaps could serve as a blueprint for application to many other genetic disorders, especially as whole genome sequencing gains more and more traction. So in parallel with this, whenever we find novel coding variants, so we do have a return of results committee where we try to return our results in real time to families so that they can be acted upon without too much delay. And we've returned around 60 such findings already to families where they did not have a genetic diagnosis. These are the members of our group. And this is the paper that, show, that uh, describes our approach, what processes worked, what are the costs associated with it. And Tanya, who's a research manager with my group, was the first to offer on this. Most of the work that I presented, almost all the work that I presented today is in a preprint uh, article in Med Archive. It's accessible, it's open access to anyone. Uh, it was the first co-first authors on this were Robert LeSerf and Abdus Said. Robert is a senior bioinformatician, uh, and these are the other bioinformaticians from my group, as well as Jeroen Breckpot, who, is, who was with us for a year. He's a clinical geneticist at the University of Leuven. From the vet lab perspective, Abdo did a lot of the functional work in the myocytes, uh, helped with the MPRA, did the luciferase assays, uh, along with Fintan McKenna for the tissue studies, Guliang Meng, who did the cardiomyocyte differentiations, Kate D. Floss, who did, uh, helped with the MPRAs, and Rimmel Noche, who helped with the zebrafish work. And of course, these are our heart center biobank coordinators who do all the recruiting of patients and the data collection. I want to conclude by really acknowledging the PIs of our, of, and the collaborators on this work. Stephen Scherer, who, uh, where we did all of our whole genome sequencing through the Center for Applied Genomics and who particularly helped us with our copy number variant analysis. James Ellis, who, with whom we collaborated for all the IPSC cardiomyocyte work and Philip Maas and Marta Mele from Barcelona, who helped with the MPRA. Obviously, a huge gratitude to Genomics England, who are making this kind of work possible, and to Bernard Kibney for giving us an approval to use uh, these genomes. Uh, our funders, primary funders for this work are the Ted Rogers Center for Heart Research, the Heart and Stroke Foundation, and CIHR. And we were very pleased recently to receive a grant from our federal funding agency, CIHR, to continue our functional work in regulatory variants in cardiomyopathy based on our, our on this work. And finally, of course, our patients and families from the Heart Center Biobank without whom this would not be possible. So thank you very much once again for your attention and I look forward uh, to questions. Thank you. Seema, that was a tour de force. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna uh, try and unshare just to come out of this. Uh, so I'm just looking for first questions. I just wanted to start off, Seema. So thanks very much for all you've done with us. Uh, to what extent do you think that the regulatory variants could, perhaps combined with other variants, explain variable penetrance of cardiomyopathy? Uh, because you showed different uh, fold effects on RNA. Um, th this could mean that certain specific variants are having an impact but modifying the disease but are not the only pathogenic variant. I think that's a great question and there were as you said as you said rightly there were many patients who had multiple who had both types of variants and we just recently were reviewing a paper in our lab meeting which did show that depending on the location of the regulatory variants, if you have a coding variant yeah. and then depending on the location of the regulatory variant whether it's in cis or in trans it can influence the expressivity or the penetrance of the coding variant. So that's an absolutely, I think it's a huge uh, you know, area of, uh, that we, that we act ourselves want to focus on, but I think that will come out over the course of uh, research. Okay, that's great. Um, to what extent have you used AI programs like uh, Promoter AI, which I think, to be honest, is still a work in progress, but, but could identify and focus the search uh, so we haven't used specifically promoter AI, and uh, we used a bunch of other uh, sort of databases, some of which are AI-based. I think it's um, maybe Deep Sea or Fathom MKL. Oh, one yeah. of those is uh, uh, AI-based, but we just leveraged what we had from there. We've used Splice AI for some of the cryptic yes. Splice variants, um, and I, I think uh, yes, I think there's a lot of uh, databases we should. Look at uh, so the seem of the data we've seen suggests that Splice AI is, AI is becoming actually quite good. Um, but, but, but the challenge for any of us is we need quite a lot of data to make these things work. 
uh, because otherwise uh, you might end up chasing your tail with a whole number of spurious splice junction variants that turn out not to be pathogenic at all. So um, we do we we are going to put the latest version of that in. I think promoter AI is still a work in progress, but given the number of, I mean, the 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 astonishing thing is the 29 out of 54 regulatory variants that you found there. Uh, that's astonishing. So I'm going to bring in Mikhail Sklovov and uh, um, let others ask questions and raise points. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sima. Yeah, it was a great talk. Uh, two small questions. The first about uh, regulatory variants. Uh, based on your experience, could you say uh, that most of uh, these regulatory variants localized uh, maybe approximately in one KB uh, before transcription starts site or somewhere far away from this point? Yeah, so let me answer that question. So uh, we, by design, had either chosen, chosen promoter regions, at least, based on either what was known about available, which sometimes can be more or less than the 1KB. But where we didn't know for sure from the literature or the databases, we did use 1.5KB up, uh, upstream and downstream in order to define the promoter region. So for promoters, we did it, it did focus a little bit in the areas that you talked about, a little bit by design, but the enhancer variants obviously extend much further uh, away. So for that, we did search beyond. We haven't gone to the high C uh, looking for some of those distal enhancers as comprehensively as we perhaps can in the future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, once again, about splicing variants, because you initially talked about coding and regulatory variants. And did you make separate analysis for splicing variants with splice IE or somehow? Uh, so yes, we've been uh, using, so in the data I showed you does not include the cryptic splice variants, but it does mm -hmm. capture the other splice variants that we annotate using Lofty or other, or other types of um, scoring. Uh, we, we've started looking at splice variants in this cohort and we found some that, that uh, and we found it's very good. It actually was able to detect even the canonical splice site variants. Uh, but we've, I think we found one or two so far that were not detected by the, by, at canonical splice sites. And in one of those, I think what we try to do is we, wherever we have tissue, we try to look at our tissue data to see if we can see some effect uh, before we consider it um, as potentially pathogenic or, and of course there are functional assays that would need to be done to confirm mm -hmm. some of them. Mm -hmm. Thank you once again, thank you. So uh, Seema, there don't appear to be any other questions. Uh, Mark, there are a number of questions uh, in yeah. the Q&A. So starting with Hannah Maud, how okay. are enhancer elements assigned to, the, to their target genes? Okay, far away Seema. <laughs> Sorry, um, how, how are uh, regulatory elements assigned to target gene, right? Is that the question? Yeah, enhancer elements. Uh, yeah, so um, again, it's a fairly, I probably pull up, pull up the slide to show all the various. Uh, so we use the ensemble regulatory features. We used ENCODE to define some of the regions. Um, we, we kind of looked at um, transcription fan factor. So, so I would say for regulatory elements, we really used ensemble regulatory features as our primary go-to uh, and some of the ENCODE and Fathom databases and where we didn't dickle at all, you know, they've got a, a nice um, regulatory map uh, for, the, for these variants and where that did, was not available, as I said, we used a just a genomic coordinates that spanned promoted regions, it would be expected to span promoted regions. A lot of detail, sorry, I, I know there's a lot of detail that's in our med archive paper in much more, uh, which is probably beyond uh, the ability to go through at this time but it shows how we hierarchically went through it to, um, to get our final variant set. So we've got a few more to take uh, before we finish up. Um, Ed Blair from Oxford has asked you, Seema, uh, have you studied cardiovascular phenotypes in the parents of the children with Walker-Warburg syndrome or Fukuyama muscular dystrophy? Would we expect them to have higher risk of cardiomyopathy? Uh, so I would say the short answer is we haven't. I mean, these are kind of rare disorders. What happens is that they, if they, if there is a patient with this condition, obviously the the 
patient is con continues to be screened for cardiomyopathy on every couple of years or two to three years, but parents only if they harbor the variant, uh, since we no one's looking at the non-coding at this time, it's hard to say, you know, yeah. we can't make any determination on the non-coding side of things. So uh, Dirk Wilson has uh, uh, congratulated you on impressive work and asked, have you gained any insights into LV non-compaction cardiomyopathy? Um, so LV, yeah, we kind of clubbed LV non-compaction into the non-HCM and non-DCM because we had a smaller subset. Uh, I think we only had around 20 or 30 LV non-compactions in our cohort. So I, I guess I don't have the exact uh, very, um, genes or variants that were involved, but there would be, I think as we've noticed with coding variants, the, the degree of overlap that occurs between these different phenotypic categories, I think the, we may find the same with non-coding variants. And so I think uh, we are, that was one of the primary reasons why we analyzed all the cardiomyopathies together. We did not want to study them separately because we know there is so much genetic overlap. Yeah, 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 makes sense. And the sort of follow up on this, which is analogous from uh, Santosh uh, Atanar, I think, uh, what criteria did you use to associate regulatory regions with known cardiomyopathy genes as they can be distant from the gene? So we did not look for regulatory variants. We focused only on the cardiomyopathy genes, 133 known genes, because we didn't want to fall into the trap of, of trying to find variants in genes that we don't even know are associated with cardiomyopathy because that would create a lot of noise. Uh, so I think our, our data really, for, for this set is relative, regulatory elements of cardiomyopathy genes. Thanks Seema. And Graham Ritchie's asked, um, the expression assays demonstrate a clear effect on expression levels. Do you have data on the effect of the changes on expression on the patient phenotypes as these were not knockouts? Uh, well, so, I mean, the patients, of course, were all phenotype positive, um, by definition, uh, when they were selected for, for sequencing. Uh, I think, as I said, when we're doing our genotype phenotype association studies, we are now beginning to look more carefully at burden of variants, the location of variants, gene affected, et cetera. And as you, as Mark had said earlier on the pen, how that affects penetrance as well within families. Uh, so last question, Jamal Nazir has asked, um, uh, did you say you've done electrophysiology on as a further approach to functional studies? Um, so that is part. So we do have, uh, we have a platform, Excelligence, that allows us to look at both functional or contractility using impedance. I wouldn't say it's, it's the, the, the way to look at it, as well as electrophysiology in the same system. Uh, so we've been looking at, so far we've actually, we wanted to make sure we validated the functional assays in sort of myosin, in myosin mutations, where you know they're definite disease causing, but now those approaches are being applied to like the Fukutin uh, patient that we, we're currently studying. So yes. Uh, I think, you know, we, you can get things like sodium current information. You can get the equivalent of QT prolongation by looking at field potential duration. You can look at the rhythmogenicity index. So it can be quite a powerful tool, uh, but I think there are some limitations because of the var intrinsic variability amongst different sort of cardiomyocyte, depending on how they've been differentiated. So we have to do multiple replicates to be reproducible. Seema, that was absolutely super. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks for joining us today, presumably from Toronto. Uh, so you're yes. very welcome. And thanks for all you're doing to advance the cause of inherited heart disease. So I'd like to thank Wayne uh, as well as you. What a cracking start to the Genomics England Research Seminar Series. Um, just to mention while we're here, uh, before we close, at the peak, there were 262 people watching the speakers and uh, listening to the seminars. And the next seminar details are 30th of March at 2 p.m. Uh, UK time. Please do join us and contact our GSIP team in the usual manner about any publications you have so we know where you are with publication or speaking at a future seminar if you wish to. You can view our G Word podcasts led by our CEO, Chris Wigley, today. And he's asked you to all get in touch if you have any suggestions about these interactions and how we make them really, really good. Um, and please do use the GSIP Twitter and the research portal uh, to look and see what research is going on and initiate that. So it remains to thank Zan and the GSIP team for organizing today. 
I'd like to thank you, Seema, for speaking and Wayne. What a cracking start. Thank you so much, uh, everybody, for joining. And I wish you uh, an excellent rest of your day. Take care now. Bye.